Hello and welcome to Cool Time Life. I'm your host, Steve Prentice. Each of our Cool Time Life podcasts focuses on a topic dealing with people, productivity, and technology. And each offers ideas and facts you need to know about to thrive in today's busy world. An index of our podcasts is available at steveprentice.com under the podcast tab. I had the pleasure recently of meeting Becky Berlan, who is the creator of the warinmykitchen.com, a website dedicated to exploring food and recipes during the rationing period of the Second World War. And she's also the editor and compiler of the companion book entitled Generations Cookbook. At a time when we are all facing significant uncertainty, this website and book shine a light on the can-do attitude of our grandparents and great-grandparents of eight decades ago. And as well, they provide a fascinating insight into the foods and the ingredients that we had available, or they had available back then, and the techniques they used to prepare them. This was life during Depression and during wartime. So Becky, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Steve. I'm so excited that you had me here. The War in My Kitchen website is truly impressive. It's a marvelous collection of blogs and articles covering meal preparations, ingredient types, special holidays, all in the lens of the time of war and rationing and making do. It's a window to another time, not only for people who enjoy cooking like myself, but anyone who wants to see what life was like back just a few generations ago. So Becky, how did this come about? I mean, what was the motivation behind the website and the Generations Cookbook? The whole concept of the war in my kitchen has actually been bumping into me for quite a long time. Um, I'd have to say the idea to put together the book, the blog, social media presence, the way of life it actually started about 20 years ago. I moved out on my own for the first time, and I rented the downstairs of an old Victorian house in Ripon, Wisconsin. And the vacated owner had lived there for well over 60 years. And it was cleaned out. It was a very nice, clean house. But I went over literally above and beyond to clean a cupboard shelf inside of a closet that took a 10-foot ladder to reach. And in the very back corner, I uncovered the previous owner's World War II ration books, and they had unused stamps still inside. I had no idea what they were, but my grandmother was there helping me clean. And she simply said, hold on to those. Those are really old. I had no idea what they were. Couldn't ex- she didn't explain it to me, but just her telling me to hold on to them was enough. And through military moves with my husband, through, um, I think we went through four different states, everything. Ten years later, um, when my grandfather died, and he was on the other side of the family, and when he died, my mother was the chosen child put in charge of cleaning out the basement. And it, in essence, was a five-generation family museum. My parents had, my grandparents had kept everything. My mom came across trunks of recipe pamphlets from the World War II era and even previous. Um, these booklets became highly collectible, I found out. And they usually came with the baking products as a promo item during the 20s to the 50s. So it'd be like um, Betty Crocker's tips, or it could be like a gold medal flower, Pillsbury flower, things like that. And they were whimsical, and the words that they used to to describe cooking and baking were just very different from how we how we write recipes now. And I just fell in love with them. And amongst those pamphlets were also family recipes as well, five generations of them. They were handwritten recipes, became the Generations Cookbook, which is the book that's featured on the War in My Kitchen website. How do the recipes and the techniques differ from how we do things today? A lot of it is is how they go into maybe describe what you're about to cook. Things will be delightful. Um, it, it will delight your husband. It will be pleasant. Um, a digestible Crisco. Crisco was going through a change where um, I don't know if it was just the recipe was was making it was giving people upset stomachs, but Crisco comes to mind because it became digestible. And uh, their slogan for a little while on their recipe books was Crisco. It's digestible. So some of that um, 
vitamins, nutrients were a new thing because this was just on the end of the Depression era. And it was the first time that the government, at least in the United States, was starting to look at um, recommended daily nutrition. So they started, um, there's a lot of education about what vitamins were and minerals. And they started using the word pep a lot. Um, certain cereals would give you pep. And there was even a cereal named pep because it gave you pep. <laughs> this was an era where science was just moving into the kitchen a little bit, uh, describing the chemistry of food ingredients, for example. And this, of course, led within a decade to an explosion in highly processed foods like hydrogenated foods and refined flours and refined sugars, basically the kinds of things that we now are consuming way too much of. So our physiologies were designed to process tougher foods, after all, like root vegetables and whole grains that you have in these recipes. So it's certainly interesting to observe these marketing concepts like PEP creeping into the language at that time. And it reminds me, if you think about products like Coca-Cola, you know, what its primary active ingredient was. Cocaine. <laughs> yes, it was considered a medicine. And it certainly helped keep people going. Absolutely. So, so I can imagine that putting this website and book together was a wonderful voyage of discovery for you. Let's just talk about the book, The Generation's Cookbook, for a moment. How did you pull together the recipes and the material? So the book... Uh, the main book is is the Generations Cookbook, and it is it, it literally is what I took from uh, the family recipes. Uh, some of them don't even have instructions. Some of them are just a list of ingredients. And I I realize that for um, for a new cook or for an inexperienced cook, that's got to be very frustrating <laughs> to not even know what you're supposed to do with the combination of these ingredients. But I was I was trying very hard to to put it exactly into book form the way it was written. And it, it that makes it part of the personalities of the women who wrote those recipes. And what it is is uh the women as my great great aunt uh Adeline, my great grandmother Mabel, my great grandmother Edith, and my grandmother Barbara. And uh there's a few aunts and my mother also come into the book when they had given one of those women a recipe and it became part of their recipe box as well. It's um, a, a short bio of each woman starts their chapter of recipes. A timeline of what they all witnessed in the kitchen runs from the time that Adeline was born until um, Barbara was, I think, I, if I remember right, it goes all the way to where Barbara passes away. She's the youngest of, of the women. And it's, you know, Auntie lived into her 90s. She absolutely loved, loved making fudge. So there's very, quite a few variations of fudge. She was known for her sunshine cake. And in her time, she witnessed the invention of Jello, Twinkies, indoor plumbing, gas and electric ovens, everything. She even held out on putting indoor plumbing into her house until the mid-60s. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the cookbook reads exactly as they were written, like I said. And um, I, I think when somebody outside of our family reads the cookbook, they feel like they were invited to our family potluck and that they're leaving the potluck with some of their favorite choices of the dishes that were on the picnic table. It's interesting to think about the assumptions and the standards of that time. I mean, obviously, this was an era where it was expected that women did all the cooking and were instructed to create meals to, quote, please the husband when he comes home from work. And it also presupposed that you would have been taught the skills of basic cookery from your own mother and grandmother and aunts, so that when you take these recipes, you do know what to do. It reminds me of Julia Child and the English cookery queen, Mrs. Beaton. Uh, they would both have recipes for things like preparing a goose, in which the first step was to defeather and gut your goose. So you'd have to know these kinds of things before starting to cook it. So I imagine you have tried these recipes and techniques out. Does your family get to be the test audience? We, I, I have, yes. Um, originally, when I launched the War in My Kitchen website and the, the project, the blog part of it, I... I had uh, I had set the date to begin of living the World War II food lifestyle and rationing on the day of Pearl Harbor, December 7th. 
So I had um, about about three months of prep time where I gathered actual World War II era meal planners. They There used to be this um, Health for Victory Club, and all you had to do was mail in your name and address. And they would send you a monthly book, a pamphlet, that would tell you what to eat for every meal for every day of that month. And they had the recipes also. And it was it was really interesting because in addition to having your lunch recipe, you'd also have your lunchbox recipe for the war worker who was leaving the house to go eat their lunch in a cafeteria or on a work job. And my poor husband, there were lots of sandwich spreads when it comes to World War II. They were really into uh, experimenting with sandwiches. And they didn't seem to have cold cuts. I mean, I'm sure they did in delis. But at the time, a sandwich spread might be peanut butter mixed with raisins or ground bologna mixed with pickles, which is one of my family's favorite that I grew up on. But to my husband, that was that was different. There were a lot of recipes that he found to be extremely bland. And that was it was so because they didn't use a lot of spices. And I didn't notice that until we were about um, two weeks into the recipes. I thought, yeah, there's no flavor in this food whatsoever. <laughs> I wonder if you brought somebody back from 1930 or 1945, whether they would agree that their food was bland. I mean, maybe it was, but it might also be because of our tastes today, where we are just so much more used to flavors and sugars and additives. It was uh, salt. We use so much salt now. And we, um, I mean, even just some of the spices, like um, the Asian spices that you might think of, cinnamon seemed to be only used in maybe a cookie recipe. It wasn't something that you would add to, well, I didn't see a lot of stir fry recipes at all because it hadn't been influenced by GIs returning home. A lot of people credit World War II for bringing pizza and a lot of our Italian dishes that we love so much, making it mainstream after the war. A lot of the GIs returned to the United States and opened restaurants based on the wonderful new foods they had experienced uh, overseas. I was listening to a podcast interview with Penn Gillette recently. He's the magician from Penn and Teller. And he was talking about how he lost 100 pounds quite quickly. And this was on doctor's orders due to high blood pressure. And his doctor had told him to cut out pretty much everything that he loved. And he said that from that point on, everything tasted extremely bland and tasteless for about two months. And then, boom, his sense of taste changed and he discovered just how much flavor was actually in those foods that he had first thought of as so bland. So I see that as a very interesting parallel in our culture today. The coarse and more natural substances that people would have eaten back then compared to what we are now used to. So when you look at what people ate and how they prepared food back then, as compared to now when you might have a two-partner family with or without kids, both of whom have to be spending much of their time working or maybe even in these changing times, they might be at home, but they're still not open to the idea of spending the entire day in the kitchen preparing foods. So when you look at the ads on TV for prepared ingredients solutions like HelloFresh, with even pre-cut servings of vegetables, what are your thoughts in light of what people in the 30s and the 40s would have done? You know, I the HelloFresh and the door delivery things, I can see the convenience of it. And I can imagine that if I would have been a homemaker that was suddenly thrown into a war job, that I wasn't... I wasn't ready to shift all the household chores to. I, I'm a little bit sad that it's come to that where kitchen prep and meal prep, it coming, it's coming from a box instead of a grandmother or a mother or somebody who just is able to go back to their natural instincts and know how to cut a carrot or how to quickly chop an onion or or things like that. It's it's a little bit of that. I think there is a lost art of cooking and baking. And when we learn everything from YouTube or an app, we miss out on the human side. Over and over we keep understanding that food is love. It's been proven for centuries. 
And when we remove the humanness of that experience and the experience of cooking from memory or a handwritten cursive recipe with cursive not even being taught anymore, we lose part of our heritage. Some people now, having a little bit more time on their hands than they used to, and not by choice, of course, as we are recording this podcast, everyone is still in lockdown. Many people are actually learning how to bake bread and do a few of these kitchen things. A lot of them seem to be getting back into something that they have always wanted to do and try out. In light of this pandemic outbreak, because even when it is over and we return to some sense of altered normalcy, there's no question we have turned a major cultural corner, including how we purchase and prepare foods. So what message would you want your website and book to send? Well, the War in My Kitchen project, it's always been about ensuring that the stories from and about the people on the World War II home front uh, are not forgotten how they managed to grow much of their own food in, in victory gardens, how to cook, preserve, manage the rest of the household tasks, like a lot of the cleaning, the mending. They were volunteering and they were taking on war jobs. And parts of the World War II lifestyle are, are resurging, best described as the home front battle cry, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. I think as time goes by, and now especially since coronavirus, it's it's especially devastating to the age group that lived through World War II. And, and we're, we're going to be witnessing that knowledge just of how to make do to that extent of living is, is going to fade away with, with how this virus is taking a toll on, on that age group. And I think it's a wake-up call to reflect on the similarities and differences of our current way of living with that of the World War II generation as well. The post-war years are historically marked as those that started a noticeable burden on resources. Lots of food waste, plastic was became so wide used, disposable packaging, bigger houses, bigger cars, all of that. And are we at a point right now inside the pandemic response where we're proud of our personal resourcefulness and efforts to conserve items in our own homes? Will we continue some of these new ways? And I've noticed that habits are reformed after 14 or 21 days of reprogramming. I've heard both, 21 and 14. And lifestyles are reformed after 40 days of reprogramming. So what will this current state of living mean as we move into a new normal? My grandmother and so many others of the same generation had a funny way of reusing wrapping paper and repurposing pantyhose that had snags in them. And I wonder what behavior triggers from coronavirus will the toilet paper shortage of this crisis cause us? It's a remarkable look back to the past. But I would be curious to see if it also turns out to be something of a window into the future, especially at this time when so many of us are being forced to reevaluate our time and our priorities, which is what this Cool Time Life podcast is always all about. So where can people follow you? Where can they read your blogs? Where can they get hold of your book? So I have a website called thewarinmykitchen.com. Everything related to my World War II food rationing project can be found there. I have an Instagram account called The War in My Kitchen and a Facebook page called The War in My Kitchen. The Generations Cookbook can be found on Amazon. And uh, I would advise ahead of time, listeners, this is purposely written in very raw form, meaning some recipes were recorded as a list of ingredients with no instructions. Or some in recipes refer to ingredients and methods that pertain to non-modern convenience. A new cook would likely be very frustrated with me for the way it's written but still fun to read. Becky Berlan, this has been so interesting and so relevant. And of course, the links that you mentioned here will be included in the show notes of this episode. Do you have any other thoughts you would like to share to our Cool Time Life listeners? I would just say to anyone who still has uh, somebody in the age bracket of, uh, let's say, from 90, from, from 100, from 100 to the age 70, um, if you still have those people in your life and you're still able to talk to them and ask them questions and when all this craziness is over with coronavirus, if you can still hug them and, and, and just be with them, don't lose out on that opportunity because it's, that's really what this is about. It, it just, it feels like we're like time slips away 
and we can't get it back. And that's, that's a huge part of what this is. So Becky, thank you so much for joining me on the Cool Time Life podcast. Thank you for having me. So there you have it, our podcast featuring Becky Berlan, author and curator of the warinmykitchen.com website and the Generations Cookbook. Links to the website and to her social media connections are available on the show notes to this podcast. Just go to steveprentice.com, go to the podcast tab, and you'll find The War in My Kitchen listed in our episode list. If you have a comment about this podcast or a question you'd like answered in a future episode, please do let me know. You can drop me a line through the contact form at steveprentice.com, or you can also find my links to Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And if you like what you hear, please do subscribe and leave a review. And please just tell one more person about this podcast. Until next time, I'm Steve Prentice. Stay safe and thanks for listening.